You are very welcome back. Now, our next guest has been the face of BBC Breakfast for the past five years, with a broadcasting career spanning over the last two decades. Must have started when he was about eight. Oh, exactly, yeah. And now he's turned his talents to writing with a brand new book inspired by the people and stories he's encountered along the way. Now, it's already being labelled as an antidote to the darkness of recent times. TV host and author Dan Walker joins us on the line to tell us more about it. Good morning, Dan. Thank you for being with us. Good morning. Hi, Dan. So, I mean, I was seven, by the way. Seven when I started. Morning, Anna. Yeah, I was thinking, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You're not on the telly 20 years, are you? Because you started as a journalist, am I right? Yeah, over 20 years. I start. I was. I was uh, started off in radio, but I've, um, in 1998. So uh, yeah, long time ago. 20 years. It's incredible. I, 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 we were talking obviously before we came on air, and uh, <laughs> to say that I'm a fan of football focus would be putting it mildly. So let's talk about football focus first before we get to the book. Um, it is a national institution. Uh, you have brought something to the show, though, Dan, in terms of, from a viewer's point of view, from a football fan's point of view, it's just like watching other pans of yours sitting around chatting about football. And that kind of natural ease, uh, and we know this, it's difficult to get across through a television lens, but you guys have it nailed. And that's driven by you, really. Oh, it's very nice of you. I've just recorded what you said. And you're playing <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's, the, that's the whole essence of what we've been trying to do, to make sure that, you know, there's so much football content out there and we know we're in a really um, <clears throat> sort of crowded marketplace. There's live football on quite a lot of the time when mm. football folks is on as well. So we know we've got to make it as tight as it can be and also just make it fun and interesting. And we wanted it to be that you watched it and then you feel that you could have that conversation. You can come and join us. You know, whether that be in the pub or in the living room, and you could be part of that conversation yeah. as well. So I'm, I'm really glad that it works for you, Simon. Good. It certainly <laughs> does, Dan. He's like your biggest fan here this morning. Uh, not that I'm not, uh, but I'm much more interested in, in <laughs> yeah, BBC. It's slightly awkward now, Anna, isn't it? <laughs> slightly awkward. I leave, will I? <laughs> uh, I want to ask you about BBC Breakfast, uh, Dan, because we often talk on this show about how the most arresting moments in, in, uh, in our experience on Ireland AM have been from very ordinary people with you know, these extraordinary stories. They're the moments that stop people in their tracks in their kitchen and actually, you know, have them glued to the TV. Your book is about remarkable people. Is that something that you can relate to? A hundred percent, Anna. I think, you know, we're, you know, we're in a privileged position, aren't we, where we get to meet some truly amazing people. And I think, you know, you're probably <laughs> of the same opinion as me, that when you interview hundreds and thousands of people over the years, there are just some that stick in your mind for whatever reason that might be. And... All I try to do in this in this book, um, remarkable people, is actually go back and revisit those people who I can't get out of my head for whatever reason. You know, people who've done amazing things, people who inspire others, people who have dug deep when they've been in really difficult times and somehow found a light in the darkness and a, and a way through to the other side of things. And I think um, what I hope is that when people read the book, they see that that is something that can inspire them as well. And that ability, I think, to even though times can be really dark and difficult, that you can be struggling without failing, that there's so many people in the book who feel even themselves that they are broken, but they're still able to be brilliant and still able to have a massive impact on the people around them. And I think that is, you know, for, particularly for 2020, that's a really powerful thing. Absolutely. No doubt about it. I can imagine, though, uh, Dan, that it wasn't the easiest book to write because you were... You were revisiting some stories that, that, that were difficult stories, you know, and you, you had personal experience. You were friends with some of these people. One, one story, one chapter we might just talk about is, is Gary Speed. Uh, you might just remind us about Gary Speed, an incredible footballer, went on to be a manager, but lost his life uh, at a very young age. Tell us about Gary. Yeah, I was good friends with Gary. I, I interviewed him as a player. And then when he became a, a manager, a manager of Wales, he was a regular pundit. And you know, we, we had a really good relationship. And you might remember he actually was a guest on Football Focus back in November 2011. Mm -hmm. And there's a picture sat alongside Gary McAllister, his former uh, teammate at Leeds that day. And um, I spent, you know, six odd hours with Gary that day. <clears throat> he was normal. Uh, we had the regular chats, you know, took the mickey out of each other. He <clears throat> took the mickey out of Gary McAllister's cardigan. They were great friends. After the programme, I took him upstairs and Alan Shearer was in for match of the day. So it was a totally normal day. And the, and the final thing I said to him was, I'll call you on Monday and we'll organise a game of golf. Um, and then Alan Shearer actually rang me the next morning and said, have you heard about Gary? And um, I actually thought he was talking about Gary Lineker, who um, had presented match of the day the night before with Alan, you know, and something happened to Gary. Mm. He said, no, Speedo, he's gone. 
And for those who uh, you know don't remember, um, Gary uh, died that morning. He was um, found in his garage, and um, he left behind a huge hole uh, in many people's lives, front page and back page news, because he, he seemingly had the perfect life. And I wasn't sure whether to write about it for the book, in all honesty, but it was only after talking to the family and after his two sons, uh, Eddie and Tommy Speed, agreed to talk um, that I thought maybe, and there they are, maybe it would be a... You know, something that would be quite poignant and, and not only helpful for them, but also helpful for other people who were aware of, you know, the, the impact that Gary Speed had on football and on life in general, but also wanted some answers. And those two boys, I started off writing the chapter about Gary, but it became about Eddie and Tommy because they are truly inspiring. Obviously, they go through those range of emotions that anybody who has lost somebody in that way would do. They've, they've been angry. They've been absolutely devastated, heartbroken. They have felt guilty. Mm. And essentially, it comes down to they miss their dad. They wish he was there. They wonder why he did what he did when he loved them so much and they loved him so much. And I think to, to their mind, and I speak to Alan Shearer, who's not spoken about losing um, a good friend and Gary McAllister and, and uh, Gary Speed's old agent, uh, a lady called Mel Chappell as well. And all of them are of the opinion that Gary wasn't depressed, but something happened that night. And for whatever reason, he, he did have some mental issues, everybody thinks, he felt that there was no other way out. Mm. And I think both his sons and everyone else is of the impression um, that if somebody had got to him that night, then he'd still be here. Mm. And, um, you know, that's, there's a real sadness in that chapter. But when you, when you hear from those two boys who are still, they love their dad so much and they would love for him to call them and, you know, be able to speak to him and tell them how proud he is of them now. And he should be proud of them now because they're amazing. But obviously that's a, that's a relationship which has gone forever. But, Dan, that is so lovely that you said it ended up being more about them because that's yeah. exactly what Gary Speed or any parent would want, isn't it? Exactly, yeah. And, you know, and also, they, they don't... You know, they're, they're, they're very self-aware. They know that people have been through a lot harder lives than, than they have had. They've been very privileged, well taken care of. And essentially, what they're talking about is something that anybody who has experienced, you know, the loss of someone very near. And I, it's hard to say suicide because the coroner said it's not enough evidence to yeah. say that it was suicide. But um, I think the way that they speak and the understanding they have of the issue of mental health and their own mental health as well, <clears throat> which is really important, I think, I, I hope that in reading the chapter, it's, it is something that, even though it's sad, I, I hope that it encourages other people who might be going through something similar to know that if you need help, go and find it, go and speak to somebody, because Eddie and Tommy are really aware of that in their own lives. And I think that's, that's quite a powerful message to come out of an awful situation. Isn't it amazing that, you know, out of that chapter, the two lads have become the remarkable people, as well as their dads? Yeah, and that, that's really why... When I, I felt such a deep responsibility, Simon and Anna, yeah. writing that book, and particularly that chapter. And I, I sort of, you know, I agonised over that for such a long time. Had I written it in the right way? Had I been fair? Had I been accurate? Mm. Had I been you know, showing the, the, sim the sympathy that is needed in that chapter. So when Eddie and Tommy came back to me afterwards and said, we love it, we're really happy with it, and I just thought, well, that is, that's a huge thing. And another friend of mine who, who lost someone in a similar way read the chapter and said, I wish somebody had been able to write something like that about me so that in later life when, you know, they had a, a new friend or they met somebody who was special to them, they could have said, listen, if you want to understand who I am, what I've been through, read this. That's amazing. That's, it really is. You know, yeah. that's praise indeed. Listen, great job. It's, it's a great book, and uh, th we really appreciate your time this morning. And uh, we we'll see you on Football Focus the weekend. Keep up the tweets, Dan. Thank I'm so loving the tweet me. about uh, the ratings on BBC Breakfast. Uh, despite <laughs> stiff competition from everybody loves Raymond and Paw Patrol. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Dan. Take care. Take care, Dan. Lovely to have you. See you later. Now, Dan's new book, Remarkable People, is available now online and in all good bookshops nationwide. Right, we'll take a quick break. Join us over in the kitchen for a Halloween-themed dish next.